Hello and welcome to this evening's Hip Historian Virtual Happy Hour Tour. I am Brenda Holt with AARP Arizona. During the month of March, we will focus on providing resources to help consumers manage their debt and savings and provide trusted information to make the best financial decisions. AARP is your wise friend and a fierce defender of consumers' finances, and we are helping you manage money while fighting on your behalf to protect what you've earned. We are here for you, and we will help you navigate the challenging road ahead. Visit us at aarp.org backslash money or aarp.org backslash money map. AARP is the nation's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering people 50 and older to choose how they live as they age. With a nationwide presence of over 38 million members and 900,000 right here in Arizona, AARP works to strengthen communities and we advocate for what matters most to families, such as health security, financial stability, and personal fulfillment. We're glad you can join us this evening. I'll now turn things over to Marshall Shore. Well, hello, good evening. I want to welcome you all to Arizona History Happy Hour. So happy that you can all be here as we get ready for another fun episode, as we get a chance to tour around Arizona talking about all kinds of great stuff. All right. So I am your host, Marshall Shore. Now you might wonder, what's going on today? Well, you know, today is April 28th. And so, on this date back in 1700, in Arizona history, Father Kino wrote in his diary that work had begun on the foundation of the first church at San Javier del Bac, which you can go visit, has been undergoing some restoration and looks really spectacular now. So go on, check it out. It is All Snow, National Great Poetry Reading Day. And, you know, it's at the tail end of National Poetry Month. And so this really marks a time where we should celebrate some of those amazing poets such as Maya Angelou, maybe T.S. Eliot, or in Arizona, folks like Alberto Rios, or even um, the, po the po Poet Laureate for Phoenix. So, you know, it's also Superhero Day which is a day where we choose to honor folks that some have masks, some don't have masks, some are fictional, some are real, but you know what they do all offer is they offer us hope of what's to come. Now it's also National Blueberry Day, National Blueberry Pie Making. So, you know, because elsewhere, like off on the East Coast, it's picking season for wild blueberries. Now, in Arizona, pretty much I think the only place you can pick them is probably your local freezer at your local market. But, you know, go right ahead and bake yourself a pie. It is also Thank You Thursday, which is a day where we all show gratitude and really kind of respond to the fact that it can make a huge difference in our professional lives and even in our personal lives, just saying thank you to folks. All right, so what can you expect on Arizona History Happy Hour? Why, we're going to have a blast. We have a little bit of trivia coming up. We've got From the Vault, which is something in plain sight, but you have to be close by to even get close to it. Um, a little bit of Arizona music history. We do a little Arizona talking about a small town, as well as there is a libation. And we also have a special guest. And so... If this is your first time watching, you might wonder, who is that man and why is he on my screen? Well, you know, I got to Arizona 
about 22 years ago. I was working in Brooklyn at a little Carnegie, actually a little big Carnegie library, and decided it was time to get out of the cold. And so moved to a library in South Phoenix that had a rich oral tradition of the community. And so that got me thinking, no one else is really doing this around for other communities. So that's just what I started doing. And then promptly moved into a beautiful 1956 ranch that used to be oh so many tones of beige inside and out. I am happy to say now it is a lovely seafoam and cantaloupe outside and inside we have such great things as buttercream yellow tile fresh off a pallet from 1956 as well as the matching appliances. Now, as soon as we got here, all we kept hearing about how there was no history here. But, you know, every time I went for an adventure, no matter whether it was just down the street, whether it was across town or across the state, I kept running into so many amazing people, places, and stories. And then there's that post-war boom that I think in so many ways made the Arizona that we all know and love today. And they really changed how America and how Arizona lived. A lot of them moved here to get a new way of life. And that's exactly what happened. Lots of change. Now, I'm also known as the hip historian, which means I get to play a lot with Arizona history. Why, just today, I did a little kind of an ambassador for Phoenix for Teach for America as they are getting ready to bring a whole new crowd to the valley across the entire valley. And so it was a chance to really kind of talk up and talk about some of the amazing little towns that make up the megapolitan of Phoenix. And also this weekend is Arizona Tiki Oasis. And so doing a lot with them while we're doing a neighborhood tour tomorrow afternoon of the neighborhood just south of the Valley Ho, kind of our little Palm Springs. And then we are doing, I'm doing a couple, I know Vic is going to be there from Mesa doing a presentation all about neon history in Arizona. So that's going to be exciting. And then there is a burlesque show that I'm the MC for. So lots of fun going on there. And then this weekend is also Rainbows Festival. So I'm not going to be there Saturday, but I will be hanging around on Sunday. And then Sunday night, I'm going to be out in Gilbert. I, for a comedy show that I don't think I'm doing comedy. So if you want to see what I'm going to do on stage, there is one way I know you can see that if you come on out and support us. It's all for a good cause. And we just did the dress rehearsal last night for Ignite Phoenix 20, where I am one of 12 speakers chatting for five minutes about a wide variety of topics, and some of them are really good. So come on out and join the crowd. That will be lots of fun. And so that is next Wednesday at Scottsdale Center for Performing Arts. Just announced the original Farmer's Market in downtown Phoenix is going to be relocating uh, May 7th to a new home. So this will be the last chance you get to go to the Saturday market down at the public market. They're going to be finding a new home over on 5th Street and McKinley. So go check it out. All right, so I now I see like Sarah and Pam, you've all found the chat. If there's something you want to say that you don't get a chance to get in the chat, you can always throw me a note on Facebook, Instagram, email. I love to hear from you all because a lot of times that's where I get my best stuff is from things you've said. Well, you know, it would not be a happy hour without PJ's influence. And so tonight he has made a little cocktail called Polly's Punch. And so let's fire up the bartender and see if he's going to be able to help us. Well, he's kind of a quiet guy, but thanks to PJ's help, all I got to do is unscrew the lid and pour Polly's Punch into my cup. And so what are we drinking? Well, it's a little bit of Grand Canyon rum, some lychee, some elderflower, rose, orjata, and blueberry lemonade. So I have a feeling this is kind of all because a little bit, a little kind of an homage to Tiki Oasis happening this weekend. As you can see, he's got a great little tiki mug right there. So, all right. So now let's try. 
Polly's Punch. Oh, and Polly's Punch does indeed pack a little bit of a punch. Well, there you go. All right. So then we have Little Arizona. So, you know, I talk about being from New York, but I really grew up in a small town in Indiana. And so tonight we're going to talk about a delightful little town that some of you may have been to before, Oracle, Arizona. It's got a population of just over 3,500, established in 1880, and was originally named because there was a boat that then wound up called the Oracle, that then wound up being named for the first mine. And eventually that became the name of the town. Now, it's really known for being this sky island. At 45,000 feet, it's got a temperate climate. It's got stands of trees, grass, canyons with veins of ore. And so it's also got breathtaking views. So, you know, it's, it was founded in 1880, but for over 10,000 years, it's been attracting a wide variety of people. Why the first inhabitants and visitors were the Hohogam. Now, when you get to Oracle, you can go visit the Arcadia Ranch Museum, which really talks about some of those early dude ranches. In fact, some say in the area are some of the earliest dude ranches in all of Arizona that attracted that Hollywood set. Um, this ranch house in particular has become home of the Acadia Ranch Museum, kind of the history of Oracle. And just down the way is the Oracle State Park, which is 4,000 acres of wildlife, refuge, and a portion of scenic Arizona trail. Comes right through the park. And so you can go watch spectacular sunsets, it's a great place to watch the stars because Oracle, like a handful of cities around the state, are dark sky communities, which make them all really good for watching those stars. And then you can go visit the Canali Ranch House, which was built in the late 20s and early 30s. And was the original homestead that then became part of the state park. And then there's Biosphere, which I know I've been to and is pretty spectacular. Um, I know they now allow folks to go inside Biosphere. When I was there, they only allowed you. I know, Pam, I, I forgot to change that. So I, so I saw that. So I was like, Yikes, let's try and get over that. Oh, and I was just passed through Oracle. So, yeah, so Biosphere, I mean, is owned by ASU now, and it really is a living laboratory as we try to figure out kind of how the Earth works. So go down and check it out. You can tour outside as well as inside. So lots of great stuff to do in Oracle, and you can still stay at some of those dude ranches. Yeah, I, I, have, I need to get down there so I can go inside Biosphere because I've got friends that went... And it just sounds pretty incredible. Um, one of them even got into like the bellows room. So yeah, so we need to really get down there. And now I'm so excited because we have an oh so special guest. And, you know, I'm so excited to have Patrick on here. I've known Patrick for quite a while. So let's bring him on without any further ado. Hello. Oh, wait a minute. We have we have a we have an interloping bartender. Oh no, not that. <laughs> All right. Well, Patrick, welcome. Thank you, Marshall. I'm I'm very happy to be here, and and thank you for thank you Thursday. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Aw, <laughs> and thank you for being here. So so Patrick. So a lot of people may not who you are, may not know who you are. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I am uh, a 40 year Arizona and I'm also a transplant, something we share. I was born in Indiana, um, grew up in Ohio, moved out here in 1981 and uh, Arizona is my home. I'm wearing my, you know, Phoenix Suns gear tonight because they're playing as we speak. And I am a huge fan of everything Phoenix and everything Arizona. Uh, so I went to Arizona State University. Uh, I met my wife in Arizona. We've raised three sons here and um my career has been in the nonprofit field mostly. Uh, in fact, you mentioned San, San Javier del Bach earlier. 
Uh, and I used to be the CEO of the Alliance of Arizona Nonprofits. I went all over the state helping nonprofits and giving speeches all the time about nonprofits. And one of the things that I always tell people is, do you know what the oldest nonprofit operating consistently in the United States is? And many people think it's Harvard. And I said, no, actually, it's San Javier del Bac. It's right here in Arizona. And uh, and of course, that would help people understand that, you know, churches and religious institutions are part of the nonprofit sector. Um, but it's also a point of pride for us. So I was really glad you mentioned that. Uh, so that's that's been uh, what I've done most of my life. I have, uh, for the last few months, taken on the role as CEO of Arizona Citizens for the Arts. And we are the advocacy organization for the arts and culture community of Arizona. Uh, I used to work with them a lot when I was at the Alliance of Arizona Nonprofits, and now I get to lead them. And I get to be part of the arts community, which is a super thrill for me because the arts have been part of my life forever. So uh, it's a little bit about who I am. Very cool. Well, I know we've got some great trivia coming up. And now I just want people to know that our trivia is not necessarily your standard bar trivia. So it is multiple choice. Um, but, you know, don't fret because one of them is a, well, at least one of them is the right answer. And, <laughs> and the beautiful thing, what I think is, is that we actually then will end up going through all the answers with stories about them. So next time you're able to go to a cocktail party, you'll be able to have all kinds of stories in your repertoire that you can pull out and amaze your friends with. Now you can, with trivia, I know some folks keep tabs in the chat session. Some folks keep tabs on a pad and paper. So whatever makes you happy, you go right ahead and do exactly that. And we're going to head and get started with some trivia. All right. So question one, what U.S. president vetoed the first law turning Arizona into a state? <gasps> Gasp. Could it have been A, Teddy Roosevelt, B, Thomas Jefferson, C, William Howard Taft, or D, Richard Nixon? So who do you think was the first president that vetoed the first law for Arizona to become a state? All right, question two. What world-renowned architect started building an experimental community at Arco Sante back in 1970? A, was that Frank Lloyd Wright? Was it B, Will Bruder? C, Paolo Solari? Or D, Frank Geary? So what world-renowned architect started building an experimental community up north off the I-17 back in 1970? All right, question three. What two senators from Arizona were members of the so-called Keating Five? Was it A, Mark Kelly and Kirsten Sinema? B, Paul Fannin and Carl Hayden? C, John Kyle and Dennis DeConcini? Or D, Dennis DeConcini and John McCain? So out of those choices, two of, two of those senators were from Arizona, but also part of what became known as the Keating Five. All right, question four. What event back in 1985 caused people in Arizona to see waterbed, oh, I'm sorry, to see the water in the pool slosh over the edge without them doing anything? Was it A, an earthquake in Mexico City? B, a tsunami? C, a plane crash in Casa Grande, or D, the Phoenix Lights. What event back in 1985 caused people to see water in their pools slosh over the edge? All right, moving on to that halfway point. So back in 1984, what town zip code registered as the highest per capita subscription rate to the New York Times? Was it A, Douglas, B, Portal, C, Bisbee, or D, Yuma? So back in the mid 80s, what town had the highest registered per capita subscribers to the New York Times? 
All right, question six. What powerful state legislator lost the 1986 Republican primary for governor? Was it A, John McCain, B, Jim Mack, C, Jamie Sussman, or D, Burton Barr? So which one of those legislators lost the 1986 Republican primary for governor? All right, moving on to question seven. What two candidates for governor had to run against each other twice during the same election? Was it A, Carolyn Warner and Bill Schultz? B, Terry Goddard and Fife Symington? C, Jane Hull and Janet Napolitano? Or D, Bruce Babbitt and Leo Corbett? So who do you think of those candidates were the ones that had to run against each other twice in the same election? Question eight, what legislator, what state legislator served continuously longer than anyone in Arizona history? Was it A, Carl Hayden, B, Polly Rosenbaum, C, Leah Alston or D. Burton Barr. And I'm going to take a moment and lubricate. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. So what so what are you drinking this evening? Well, uh, I didn't quite have all the ingredi ingredients for Polly's Punch. I really wish I did. It sounds great. So I'm going to go have, have to go out and, and try that. And it's a good time to point that out, right? Well, Polly Rosenbaum's name is sitting up here on the slide, right? And, and uh, indeed. I, I wasn't trying to give a hint or anything. Wink, wink, nudge, no, nudge. No, you know what I mean? No, know what I mean? Not, not a hint at all. We could be totally throwing you off with that. Uh, but <laughs> no, instead, I have my favorite, which is a margarita. You know, my go-to. Ah, nice. All right. So what well-known grocer ran for governor back in 1994? Was it A, Jack Safeway, B, Betsy Bayless, C, Sam Sprout, or D, Eddie Basha? So which one of those grocers ran for governor back in the mid-90s? All right. Question 10, how can current governor Doug Ducey make history if he finishes his term of office next January? All right, option A, he will be the first to finish two terms. B, he will be the last GOP governor. C, he will be the only governor not indicted. D, he will be the first governor since Jack Williams in 1974 to complete his service by entering office under normal electoral circumstances and end his service the same way. So how do you think Doug Ducey can make history as an Arizona governor? All right, moving on to some bonus questions. What time, what longtime legislative leader was known to serve when he was elected, but he was too young to serve. So he had to do a little finagling. So who was that? Was it A, Art Hamilton, B, Carl Knesset, C, Chris Hammerstam, or C, or I'm sorry, or D, Chad Campbell? All right, so who do you think was the Arizona legislator who was too young to serve when he was first elected? And our last question, what was the name of the first live musical comedy created in the wake of the impeachment of Evan Meekum? Was it A, Hamilton, B, Raising Arizona, C, Gov, the musical, or D, Americano. So which do you think was the first live musical comedy created here in Arizona all about the impeachment of Ev Meekum? All right. While you're trying to lock in those final answers, we are going to go on and do a little bit of an Arizona music break. And so we are going to talk a little bit about Bob Shane. So Bob Shane passed away um, back in 2020, he was 85. If you don't recognize his name, this may help. He was one of the original Kingston Trio. 
and he lived in Chandler for quite some time. But, you know, that was not the only time he had been to the Valley of the Sun. Why the Kingston Trio back in the early 60s actually did a pilot for a TV show called Young Men in a Hurry. Now, they only shot one episode. It was the pilot, and it didn't go anywhere, even though it was at the height of the Kingston Trio's popularity and could have gone on and skyrocketed. But you know why it didn't? Bob said because they, the trio were living in Hawaii and loved being in Hawaii, and they didn't want to have to come to Phoenix and do all that shooting here. They wanted to just stay in Hawaii. But it's chock full of King's Trio music, and you can still find it out there floating around. So it is well worth a watch and has some great landmarks across the valley, which are still standing. So check out Young Men in a Hurry featuring the Kingston Trio with Bob Shane. All right. So now we're on to some answers. So Patrick, are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Well, here, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to get a little more Polly's punch. That's right. A toast to the answers. Indeed. All right. So what U.S. president vetoed the first law turning Arizona into a state? It was William Howard Taft, uh, who I think also was the heaviest president. I think that's another trivia question if somebody wanted to look that one up. But, um, uh, you know, Marshall, uh, uh, I love, by the way, I just love that you're doing this program and focusing on Arizona history and helping people. You know, we have so many people here who have come from other places and, and you know they love their new state but they don't know all the history and uh and so um i obviously have been involved a, a lot in political affairs uh too so that's why i have a lot of a lot of trivia questions here about some political stories but i think the best story that basically tells you know sort of kicks off understanding arizona is this one so the way this all happened was in 1910 uh, Arizona wanted to become a state. It would have been the 47th state. And there was a law. And the way you become a state is there is a, an actual law passed by the U.S. Congress to admit a territory as a state. And Arizona was ready. So was New Mexico. We were kind of competing with them to see who would be next. And Arizona, uh, you know, had a constitutional convention and wrote a constitution. And that became part of the law. And the Congress passed the law. And they sent it on to President Howard Taft who then, of course, has to sign that law to make Arizona state. Well, he saw something in our Constitution that he didn't like, which is that we created a recall of elected officials, but not just any elected officials, but judges in particular. And he thought that was a terrible idea. And so he vetoed our uh, le the legislation making Arizona a state uh, because he said there's no way you could recall judges. That's a terrible idea. And um, New Mexico, by the way, snuck in there and became the 47th state, while the Arizona Constitutional Convention got together back in Phoenix and uh, amended the Constitution and took out the recall of judges. And so they sent that back to Congress. Congress passed the law. It went to President Taft's desk. And this time he signed the law in uh, February 14th, 1912. And that's how Arizona became a state. But then literally later that year on the ballot in in november the state legislators put because by then the constitution can only be amended by a vote of the people because that's the way our constitution is and they put a measure on the ballot putting the recall of judges right back in the constitution it passed overwhelmingly by the voters and it was it was that was from the get-go arizona saying you just try to tell us what to do with uh, federal government. We don't really like you telling us what to do. We, we want our constitution the way we want it. And of course, the recall of judges has been in there ever since. And, you know, and you're right. That does tell Arizona from the early get go. Yeah, we, we are very independent. We like to do things our own way. You know, it's funny because we're really one of the most dependent states on the federal government of any state in many ways. I mean, the Central Arizona project that is critical for the water supply in Tucson and Phoenix was built by the federal taxpayers. Um, I mean, almost no state money. That was 
that was a gift from the federal government. So, I mean, that's just one example. There are many others. And our electricity, you know, dams on the, the, the that are up on the rivers that have created these big lakes that power, you know, hydroelectric power, federally funded. So we, we actually, we wouldn't be here without the federal government, but boy, we sure love to tell the federal government to keep their noses out of our business. <laughs> Indeed. And then we won't even talk about light rail. But... Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. So what world-renowned architect started building an experimental community at Arcosanti back in 1970? So I didn't know if this was a trick question because so many people knew that Frank Lloyd Wright was a big Arizona person, but Paolo Soleri was actually the architect who uh, started Arcosanti. So if you haven't stopped by, I highly recommend it. It's kind of a fun visit. They have tours there. Uh, it's just north of the Phoenix area. It's as you're uh, the highway that goes off to Prescott off of I-17. There's actually a separate exit there, Arcosanti Road. And you can take that across a dirt road and uh, stop in and take a tour. Now, why am I telling a story about Arcosanti? Well, I actually had the great privilege of serving as CEO of the foundation that runs Arcosanti for a couple oh. of years. And so I, I got to know all about the culture of Arcosanti, uh, the history of it. Uh, and and um, Apollo Soleri uh, started it in 1970, but he didn't do it alone. Over 8,000 volunteers across uh, 50 years would travel from all over the world and spend anywhere from four or five weeks to, in some cases, months, or actually, in a handful of cases, 30, 40 years uh, living and working at building Arcosani. So everything you see at Arcosani was built by these volunteers under the guidance of Paolo Soleri. He passed away in 2013 at a very old age. And so today he's not part of the project, obviously, but his 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 memory is still there. So um, Arcosanti, now you mentioned Biosphere earlier, and I just, I, I, I got a big kick out of that because uh, Biosphere and Arcosanti have some very similar origins. They're both uh, created by people that were trying to, they were, I, you know, they're kind of contrarian, maybe call them counterculture. Uh, and they, and the, even though uh, Biosphere didn't come along till much later, the group that built Biosphere started working together and coming up with their ideas about the same time that Arcosanti was starting. Oh. The There's actually a great movie that was uh, done about three or four years ago that's on Netflix. I don't know if it's still on there, but I saw it while I was at Arcosanti and uh, it tells the story. It tells kind of an interesting story of the background of Biosphere. But anyway, uh, and, and I loved when I saw that movie because it reminded me of the history of Arcosani. But what, what the fun thing about Arcosani, uh, by the way, we could actually do about three of these happy hours in Arcosani alone. I'll just tell you, it's it's a very oh, yeah. nice... actually we had them on as a guest. Um, I think about a year ago. Oh really? Okay. So, yeah. Well, it's a very. Uh, I'd be curious to find out who, who you had on, but uh, I, it's a very funky place. It has a just fascinating um, culture. Uh, some people think it's a commune. It really isn't, but it kind of feels that way when you're there. And so, but my favorite story, I'm going to tell my favorite story about Arcosani. So in 1978, uh, one of the things that Arcosani, by then they, they had started building a fair amount, not everything you see today, but a lot of it. And there's an amphitheater there and they used to have concerts mm -hmm. and they had amazing acts. They brought in amazing artists. Uh, for example, um, uh, I, I, I just I started to say the Jackson Five. I just can't believe I was about to say that. Um, uh, I just I, oh my gosh, I blinked on the name. Well, anyway, they had some amazing big time artists. So people would drive up from Phoenix. You know, they would just mm -hmm. there would be like a line of cars going up the hill uh, and 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 parking and going into the amphitheater and watching these great concerts. Well, in 1978, um, they had one of these. And it was very popular. So I cannot believe I'm blanking on who the artist was, but don't worry about it. Uh, tons of people there. They parked their cars and it was kind of a grassy field where they parked their cars. And so they're all in, you know, at the amphitheater. It's a hot day and somebody's catalytic converter caught, uh, sparked a fire in the grass and it took off. I mean, it was a wildfire, right? And it and it literally burned hundreds of cars um in fact i have met people who say yeah my, my car burned at the arcasani concert in 1978 um 
So it, it almost buried the whole project financially. Uh, they didn't have insurance. They had to pay out, uh, oh. you know, they had to pull these cars away, all this kind of stuff, right? So I, it was an amazing, it was an incredible event in the history of Arcasani. Well, when I first arrived there, they're they're giving me a tour of Arcasani, and uh, the, the, Arcasani sits at about four thousand feet, and it's on a mesa, and it's it's the ground is super hard because it's like rock. It's up on a rocky mesa, right? So we're, we're walking around. They're showing me different things. And they get to this one spot and the ground is really soft. It's very noticeably softer than the rest of the ground. And so the person giving me the tour, you know, I have to stop them. I say, I'm sorry, but as we've been walking here, this ground is, is really soft. Why is it so different than everything else? And he said, well, you've, you've heard the story of the fire, right? I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. I've heard that story by now. Well, they couldn't take all the cars away. So a lot of them got buried. This is where they're buried. They literally buried the cars <laughs> in the ground next wow. to the property. And uh, it's just to the north. If you go there, you kind of look to the north a little bit. It's that ground that's right there. And uh, so the whole time I was there, I kept waiting for like one of those Transformer movie moments to happen when the cars just come alive out of the ground and it's going to happen. But anyway, my, my, that's my favorite Arcasani story. Wow. All right. Question three. What two sinners from Arizona were members of the so-called Keating Five? So it was Dennis DeConcini and John McCain. Uh, they were our two senators in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and uh, obviously everybody knows about John McCain. Dennis DeConcini has been out of office for a little while now, but um, was recently serving on the Board of Regents for the state universities. So um, so the, my story here is actually a personal story. It's it's actually one I don't tell really often because it's, it's, um, uh, it's kind of, it's not scandalous or anything like that. But um, so in 1982, I was a volunteer for uh, Dennis DeConcini's reelection campaign. This was when nobody had heard of John McCain. Uh, John McCain uh, was running for the House of Representatives for the very first time. And he was in a I think it was a five way primary. And uh, and and nobody had heard of him. Some people have called him a carpetbagger because he had just moved here, basically run for office. He got uh, married to you know Cindy Hensley and all of that. So anyway, um, now uh, if you don't know about the Keating Five, I'll first tell you about that because that happened later. The Keating Five was uh, it was uh, uh, five U.S. senators, obviously two of them ours, that had used what some considered undue influence. Um, with the agency that uh, oversaw the savings and loan industry. And, um, and they did so basically on behalf of a savings and loan owner who was also a, a famous developer here, uh, American Continental Homes uh, uh, developer, Charles Keating. And Charles Keating basically also had a savings and loan that helped finance all these homes he built. And he didn't like some of the regulations, so he wanted the senators to use their influence to, to uh, get the regulatory authorities to back off. Later, there would be a huge, in the early 90s, savings loan scandal. They would have to be bailed out by the federal government. Charles Keating actually would end up going to prison, right? Um, and there were, there were basically hearings held about whether the Keating Five broke Senate ethics rules in their influence uh, 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 peddling, as it were. So, um, so that happened later, right? So let's go back to 1982 and my little story of little guy, volunteer, nobody knows me. Um, and I'm working for the Dennis DeConcini campaign and I have been tasked to drive out with three other campaign staffers from uh, downtown Phoenix all the way out to Buckeye, which there was no freeway back then. In fact, the freeway didn't even connect. I-10 didn't even connect back then. That's a whole nother story. I didn't get to do a question about that, but that's another story. Anyway. So you had to drive on like Buckeye Road. It took forever, right? It took forever to get out there. By the way, I was the designated driver. I later, later learned why. Um, uh, I, I, uh, back then, actually, the drinking age uh, was different, but I, I still was not of drinking age. So anyway, I was the designated driver. And uh, so we drive all the way out to this ranch, and, and it's a big company picnic. And this ranch is where Charles Keating is having the company picnic for American Continental Homes 
like 2,000 people out there, you know, employees and their families. And so I was out there to do advance work for Dennis DeConcini. And when I got there, the campaign manager pulls me over and said, oh, uh, so DeConcini was flying in on a helicopter. He was, we had to drive, you know, out on Beck High Road, but he got to fly in on a helicopter. It's like, would you come over with me and help greet the senator, get him situated here? So I, you know, did what I was told. I followed along. And as he, as uh, Senator DeConcini got off the helicopter, uh, his campaign manager said, oh, hey, first thing, I want you to meet this candidate over here who uh, is in the Republican primary for the District 1 House seat and uh, seems like a real up and comer. I think it'd be good for you to meet him. I don't know if he's going to win the primary, but and so I tagged along and I was witness to Dennis DeConcini and John McCain meeting each other for the very first time. <laughs> uh, course, we all know the rest of the story with John McCain. He would end up winning that primary. He would end up winning in the fall. He would be in the House for two terms and he would succeed Barry Goldwater uh, in his Senate seat and serve with Dennis DeConcini and then become one of the, you know, two of the Keating Five. But I was witness when those two first met at the Charles Keating Ranch, nonetheless. Wow. True story. True story. So Pam looked up the band at Arco Sante and it was Jackson Brown. I, I, I said close. Jackson, right? I'm like, what? You were is close. And I, 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 I thought it was Jackson Brown, but I'm like, oh, I don't want to now that I don't know that you've planted that in my mind. I'm like, oh, gosh, I didn't want to throw out the wrong band. I, know. So. I, I love Jackson Brown. That's why I'm like, I can't believe I'm forgetting. Yes. Thank you for looking that up, Pam. Thank you. <laughs> this is this is called, I'm glad AARP is your sponsor. This is a thing. <laughs> All right. So what event back in 1985 caused people in Arizona to see water in their pool slosh over the edge without them doing anything? I know uh, some of you uh, thought it was a plane crash in Casa Grande, but no, in fact, it was an earthquake in Mexico City. Uh, uh, if you know, if you know or remember anything about that earthquake, it was horribly devastating to Mexico City. But yeah, actually, people in Phoenix reported seeing their pool water uh, uh, do this and then even slash over the edge. I mean, there were people, there was video of it. Um, but, uh, so why am I telling a story about this? Uh, I actually wasn't in Phoenix at the time. I had the great privilege of working for a couple of years in radio in Southeastern Arizona. I worked in, uh, Safford, uh, and, uh, I worked actually for a couple different radio stations there. And as a matter of fact, I had uh, moved from one station to the other. There were competing stations and I had just started at this station. And uh, the, uh, the day that uh, earthquake hit, um, uh, we um, knew of a ham radio operator who lived out in the middle of nowhere, kind of east of, or west of town. And he actually had a direct feed, like right after the earthquake happened, to somebody in Mexico City. Now, mind you, there is nothing coming out of Mexico City. All communications uh, uh, are, are essentially destroyed. I mean... You know, it's 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 very de devastating. But this guy was able to connect, you know, with a ham radio operator in Mexico City. And he called my station and said, I've got this feed from Mexico City. I figured you're the news. By the way, I'm sorry, I was the news director for the radio station. I forgot to say that. So he's like, you're the news guy. I figured you'd want to have this. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. So uh, I was able to literally pipe it into our studio and put it on. Back then, it was these giant reel to reel tapes. And I just started recording. Now, I couldn't understand a word of it. It was all in Spanish. OK, of course. Um, but this is a direct feed of of people calling for help and saying, go here and go there. And it was wow. like all this amazing stuff. I mean, there was actually some radio that was being broadcast. So he was having some of the radio feed. And anyway, now here's the crazy thing. I couldn't put this on the air on my own radio station because that day we were having an amazing rainstorm in uh, that part of Arizona. And it knocked out our tower. Oh. And so... Um, because I was new, the station manager said, well, you, you can't be on the air anyway. So you're going to get um, one of the rites of passage at our station is you get to drive with me up the mountain to fix the, the tower so we can get back on the air. I'm like, well, can't do anything else anyway. OK, I'll go with you. So we go driving up the mountain and we get to this wash that is raging, just absolutely raging. Now, this guy had a four wheel drive vehicle. But if you know anything about water safety in Arizona and and I mean, this guy actually grew up in Phoenix. I had only lived here for five or six years then, but I knew better. And he, so he's like, I think we can take it. What do you think? I'm like, I got out of his car. I said, if you want to do it, 
go for it. I'm standing on this side. <laughs> He's like, ah, chicken. All right, get back in. And we drove back. So we still couldn't get on the air. So, um, but here I have this amazing feed from Mexico City. Right. So the only thing I can think to do is we're part of the CBS radio network. And I send part of the feed to them. And while I couldn't get on my own radio station, that night on the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather, where they're reporting about the earthquake, they only have one sound bite. And it's my feed from the ham radio operator. And, and you know, they have a translation of it. So I get to finally see a little bit of what they were saying. Uh, and so that was my little claim to fame is that a, li a little recording I made got on the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather. Thanks, thanks to a horrible earthquake, but yeah. Right, but wow. How cool is that? But devastating on the other hand. Yeah. All right, so back in 1984, what town zip code was registered as the highest per capita subscription to the New York Times? You know, I kind of, I mean, I try to make this a little easy for people to maybe figure it out. Um, you know, I could have put like Paradise Valley and Sedona or something like that. People would think it'd be a real rush. But, but I also wondered if people would go, Portal? Portal? Where's that? So well, that's, I, that's exactly why I put it in a map. Because I'm like, people are going to go, it's like, well, where is that? And I'm like, oh. I, I don't it, think many, yeah, yeah, but yeah, it's good to leave it up there. I don't think many people have been to Portal. I feel very privileged to have... I have been to almost every town, large and small, in every part of Arizona, including Portal. Now, the story of that. Now, so at that time, and I don't, I think it's still true, but Portal is it's on the other side of the Chiricahuas. It's almost in New Mexico. And the only way that you can reach it on a paved road is actually to drive into New Mexico and then drive from I-10, drive south and then drive back over to Portal. So one day in 1984, this is while it was in radio in Safford. So it was actually, I think it might have been before the earthquake, but uh, it was the year that uh, Jim Colby was running for re-election the first time. And uh, he was the congressman for that part of the state. And uh, he invited some media people, about three of us, to travel with him and his uh, press secretary on a little junket around southeastern Arizona. Um, I had to actually go to Tucson to join them, but then they ended in Safford. That was the last event, so it's going to drop me back home. So, uh, so we we start out and we go to a couple of small towns. We went to San Simone. We went to play other places. Probably most people have not heard of, but we were running late. Politicians are always running late, right? And so um, when they were saying, we, "Well, Portal is the next stop," uh, they said, "Well, do we, you know, take the regular routes, a paved road? They've got a rental car." Or do we take, there's a dirt road you can take down from I-10, but it's, they weren't sure how well maintained it was. We're late, so we're going to take the dirt road. So we go driving down the dirt road. It's it's like 30 miles or something like that, you know, goes away. And we're, you know, we're a good way the, there. Well, it turns out they just graded it. And if you know anything about grading of dirt roads, it really brings up the sharp rocks. So you know where this is going. Yeah, we got a flat tire. So yes, I got a flat tire with a congressman. Um, and so, uh, the press secretary got the great joy to see whether they're really, you could even get a replacement tire in little portal, but there actually was a little garage there and you could. So while the Congressman was in talking to the people, now let me tell you who these people were. They were the smartest crowd who asked the smartest questions I've ever heard anybody at a congressional town hall ever. And that's how I found out that pretty much every single person there was a subscriber to the New York times. It was kind of it wasn't so much an artist colony as kind of like an intellectual colony. It was like retired corporate executives and academics. And, but I mean, amazing, brilliant crowd of people. And, wow. uh, and fortunately somebody had the ability to fix that flat tire and we were able to get back on the road, but it was, it was a fascinating place. I, I haven't been back. I mean, that was, I, I want to say it was 1984. And I haven't been back, but I, I, I want to go back again. So did you leave on the dirt road or did you take the pavement? No, we took the dirt road back because now we were really late. <laughs> wow. This was like a, a scheduled event, you know, like, a I don't know what kind of event it was, but a party event type thing and in Safford. So, uh, yeah, we still went back on the dirt road <laughs> and no, no second flat tire, fortunately. <laughs> Could have would have made you even later. Yeah. Oh, Pam says, I didn't realize. So the U of A has a research station there. In Portland. Oh, I didn't either. Oh, I, I don't know if they did then. I wonder if that came along later. So it sounds like it's probably it was a later edition, but not shocked at all. 
All right. So what powerful state legislator lost the 1986 Republican primary for governor? Well, some people may have picked a name because they just recognize it because it's it's on that building that you see to the left. That's the Burton Bar Library, which is the downtown central library. And uh, Burton Bar was the state legislator it was named for. Now, Marshall, this is kind of a nice connection for you and I, because that's how you and I first met was when you were working at the Harmon Branch Library. And I was yeah. working for a national organization, Libraries for the Future, and we had a program at your library. And that's you and I how you and I first got to met. So we had to have Indeed. a library. But yeah, so it was nice, it's nice to see a little like the, how we intersected. Yeah, yeah, we had to put the library connection in there. But um, but really, uh, the point of this story is to talk about the impeachment that came out of that election. So Burton Barr had been in the legislature since the 1960s. Back, we didn't have term limits back then. And he was considered the most, uh, next to uh, then Governor Bruce Babbitt, he was considered the most powerful man in Arizona. He, uh, he and Bruce Babbitt pretty much, you know, did everything uh, working together. And uh, he finally decided to run for governor because Bruce Babbitt was was uh, stepping down. Uh, he would run for president two years later, actually. But um, And so Burton Barr ran, was a Republican, ran um, for the Republican primary, and everybody just assumed Burton Barr is, of course, going to win. I mean, he's he's the most powerful man. He's got He's raised all the money. And his opponent in the primary was a guy who would run for either governor or senator about five or six times and lost every time. So he was like a he was like a five or six time loser. Um, and uh, his name is Evan Meekham. And uh, by the standards of 1986, he was very right wing. Uh, you know, by the standards of today, he, he might be a liberal Democrat. But I mean, by the standards of then, he, he was yeah pretty conservative. And Burton Barr was this, you know, powerful kind of moderate type Republican. And nobody gave Meekham a chance. Um, well, Burton Barr apparently didn't either. He didn't take him seriously. Meekham actually won the primary. Wow. So then everybody is like, well, there's no way he's going to win in November, right? The voters, you know, this guy kind of right wing, kind of out of touch with the mainstream of the voters. Um, and he's going to be running against Carolyn Warner. Carolyn Warner had been the superintendent of public instruction, you know, over the schools for a number of years. Very popular Democrat. But one thing they did not count on was a guy named Bill Schultz, who had actually run against Carolyn in the uh, for de in the Democratic primary, but then he dropped out of the race. So Carolyn ended up running on a pose on the ballot. Bill Schultz decided to get back in the race as an independent. And so now there was a three-way race for governor. And as we went from the primary uh, uh, primaries to the uh, general in November, uh, they would take, they put a poll and, you know, back then we'd actually go out to our driveway and there'd be this thing called a newspaper. It was on, you know, this thing. Anyway, we, we, we'd pick up the newspaper every morning and, and the polls would say Schultz is in the lead. The next day Warner's in the lead and the next day Meekham is in the lead. I mean, it was neck and neck all the way through. Wow. And the shocker was that Av Meekham ended up actually winning and uh he became governor and the very first thing he did as governor was to rescind the executive order that created the martin luther king jr holiday and pretty much from the moment that he that happened uh he was attacked by pretty much everybody uh democrats and republicans alike and independents and so uh by the end of 1987 because he took office in january of 87 by the end of 1987 the only question pretty much on people's uh, uh, you know, uh, lips was, how will they get rid of him? Will he, be, will he be convicted of a crime because there was a federal lawsuit pending against him? Will he be a subject of a recall because a recall movement was already collecting signatures? Or will he be impeached by the state legislature? Now, keep in mind, the state legislature is controlled by the Republican Party. Okay, the Republicans have a majority in the House and the Senate. And yet people, and yet they are honestly quite embarrassed by this man. And this man's creating embarrassment for Arizona. I mean, after he after he rescinded the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, we were losing convention business. We were being boycotted because we right. got rid of the MLK holiday, right? So uh, uh, in, in January of 1988, I was an intern in the state legislature. And uh, the first day uh, I arrived, the uh, majority whip of the of the House, I worked in the House, um, was Jane D. Hull. This is long before she'd be Secretary of State and later Governor. And uh, but she was kind of in charge of the intern program. And she told us all, she said, 
you're going to see a legislative session like nobody's ever seen. I recommend taking a diary because you're going to witness history. That was the moment where we all knew there's going to be an impeachment. And so literally I was in the front row of the rest of impeachment. I, I was sitting right behind Ev Meekum as he got called in front of the impeachment committee in the house that eventually approved uh, articles of impeachment. And then when the vote came up in the house of representatives, I was sitting in the gallery and we were supposed to rotate our seats because there was very limited seating, but, um, they started voting while I was there. And I mean, you've never seen anything like it in your life. Even the drama we had with the impeachment in Washington or the impeachments, plural, that we've had in Washington recently. Oh, this was much more dramatic because these were Republicans impeaching their Republican governor. There were members literally crying as they gave their speeches, explaining why they were voting either yes or no. I mean, both it was both sides. And it was such drama. I, I wouldn't give up my seat. <laughs> I was like, okay, I don't care. I'll get in trouble down in the basement with the with the Democratic staff I was working for, but I'm not leaving this. And I sat there and watched the impeachment vote as the House uh, voted out the articles of impeachment. And then later, the Senate held a trial and they convicted Ev Meekum and he was sent out of office. Indeed. Wow. So did you end up getting in trouble? You know, I, I I don't know whether I've blocked it out from my memory or whether, like, I basically, you know, obviously I said, sorry. And I, I think they probably were all like, I would have done the same thing. <laughs> oh, completely. I would have done the exact same thing as well. I am like, I wouldn't have passed that up. And everybody was watching it on TV. It's not like everybody wasn't seeing it. It's just I was. Oh, it okay, but you were seeing it live. Oh, yeah. I mean, this which all, I mean, yeah, right? It was all broadcast on TV. All the local TV stations were carrying all this drama. Yeah. Wow. All right. So, question seven: What two candidates for governor had to run against each other twice during the same election? Yeah, and and thanks for uh, correcting my weird typo there. Against either, I don't know what. Yeah, each other <laughs> twice. Uh, but anyway, yes. Uh, so this is a story that carries right on from the story I just told. It was Terry Goddard and Fife Slimington. So, um, so first of all, after Meekum was impeached, Rose Mofford became uh, governor. Um, she never wanted to be governor, but she had to because she was secretary of state and Meekum was gone and she's in line of succession. And that was in 1988. And so then the election came up in 1990. By the way, I would go on and work in her office. So I worked for Rose Mofford. Wow. Uh, in, the, in the governor's office for uh, about a year and a half. So anyway, then comes the 1990 election. Now, in 1988, uh, the voters of Arizona had to had to decide whether to pass an amendment to the Constitution. As you can tell, we like to amend our Constitution a lot, right? Comes up a lot in these stories. Uh, so there was, a, there was a measure put on the ballot in 1988 to deal with the fact that Evan Meekum was elected in 1986. Because when Evan Meekum was elected in 1986, he did not have a majority of the vote. Remember I said it was neck and neck? Oh, right. He had, he had about 40%, I think it was. And, and the other two, you know, split, um, somebody can do math better than me, whatever the rest of that is. So, um, but uh, he didn't have a majority. And so they were like, okay, well, that's why we got this guy. And that's why we had to impeach him. So let's amend our constitution that requires to be elected governor, you must win a majority of the vote. And that means that if you do have a race, like we had in 86, nobody wins a majority, the top two go into a runoff. Right. This happens in other states, too. Oh. Like the only state that does this. Um, so in 19 and so the voters passed that 1988. It's like, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Of course, we want to do that. So in 1990, we have uh, Terry Goddard, a uh, very well-known mayor of Phoenix, former mayor of Phoenix, who was or he was either then mayor or he'd already left. I forgot now if he was still mayor. But anyway, well known for being mayor of Phoenix. And then Fife Symington, well-known businessman. And um, and you're thinking, OK, is there a three way race here? Yeah, there actually is. There is this guy uh, that uh, uh, I want to say Perkins, Max Perkins. It was Max. So I just blank it on the last name right now. But and he had actually worked for Evan Meekham. He had actually worked in the administration and there was still a lot of bitterness left over from the impeachment. And so he decided to run as an independent. And he had like this much support. I mean, I think he got like two percent of the vote okay 
But Symington and Goddard were neck and neck. So we had, once again, a neck and neck race. And Max got just enough that I think each of the other two had like 49%, but it was not 50% plus one. And therefore, we had to have a runoff, okay? Which, by the way, meant that Rose Mofford had to be governor for another like three months, and she never wanted to be governor. But uh, right, which I'm sure she appreciated. You know, uh, she's like, I'm never going to get rid of this job, right? Uh, and so uh, Terry Goddard and and uh, Symington ran then just facing each other, and Five Symington would win. Uh, Rose Mofford could finally go home, and uh, and uh, but that's how yeah they they ran against each other twice. Oh, by the way. In 1990, uh, so that was 1990. In 1992, uh, there was a measure put on the ballot. Got rid of the runoff. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. And, you know, that cost a lot of money. <laughs> and so we don't have the runoff anymore. We, we did it one time. Wow. I didn't raise actually got put into play. That's crazy. This is why I love about Arizona politics. Just... It doesn't matter what happens. It's always wacky. It's always wacky. <laughs> Indeed. All right. So what state legislator has served continuously longer than anyone else in history in Arizona? Well, I sure hope everybody knew this one. And Cheers I, to oh Polly. Cheers to Polly. I, I want to tell you, this is one of the most amazing people I've ever met in my life. Polly came to office when her husband died. And, you know, that wasn't all that uncommon. It happened in Congress and I'm sure other states and their legislatures um, where, you know, a, a legislator dies and they have to replace them. And they say, well, rather than go find some hack, we're going to, you know, political hack, we're going to actually just make their spouse the legislator. And that's how she originally got into the legislature. Polly Rosenbaum was from Globe. And uh, so that was in the 1940s. And uh, when I was an intern in in uh, 1988, uh, she was still there, and I think she served until 1994. Uh, I think it ended up being something like 47 years, something like that. Um, and my story about Polly, I could, there's several stories I could tell about Polly, but the one I want to tell is, uh, by the way, Polly uh, uh, was from Globe, which is also where Rose Mofford was. I was going to say, right. I, was, I thought that was so funny. I'm like, what if we just had a Rose Mofford bit, and now we're talking about Polly. I was like, how funny. And I'll never forget talking to Polly one time, and she said, yeah, I remember Rosie when she was this high. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we all didn't know if that included the hair or not. I, I did not. If it was this high, no. Because yeah, the have, hair yeah. would have been this high. Yeah, it would have. Yeah, right. Uh, so anyway, um, so Polly, uh, because of her long service, even still in 1988, uh, was very involved in the history and anything historical. So whenever it came to um, whenever it came to the um, statehood day, February 14th, uh, Polly would would put on the event, you know, whatever the official events were going to be. And so um, I got very lucky because I worked for the Democratic uh, caucus uh, and as an intern. I got selected as one of the two or three that got to work with her on planning the uh, statehood oh, day event. Fine. So we're working on that. Now, remember, this is the impeachment session. In fact, I think, uh, well, I, it might have been before the impeachment vote. Anyway, it's all in the air. It's all, you know, impeachment politics are, are making it, you know, a very dicey legislative session. And so we're, we're just chatting with Polly about all of her years. And she said, you know what? Years ago, the interns at the end of every legislative session, they would do a mock session where... Um, you know, it would be after pretty much the legislature was done, but the interns were still there and they'd make all the legislators go sit in the gallery and the interns would take over the floor of the, of one of the chambers. And then they would play like, you know, um, uh, imitate and play the roles of all the legislators and do kind of a, you know, do a parody. Right. And she said, you know, I, we, it's been a long time since we've done that, but you know, after this year's session, we might need something like that. So a handful of us decided that Polly's idea was a good one. And we got together and we wrote a script and uh, we convinced the leadership of the legislature that they needed some levity after they literally convicted a governor and threw him out of office. And so we all got on the floor of the House of Representatives, all the senators came over to and the legislators sat up in the gallery 
And we did, I think I played three different parts. The one I was most remembered for, you, you actually had an, uh, an answer. It wasn't the correct answer, but on one of the trivia questions, it was Chris Hurston. Mm -hmm. So Chris Hurston was a longtime legislator, uh, was you know in at that time. And um, he and I have been noted for our resemblance. Uh, back then, I was a much younger version of him. Today, maybe a lot more like him. Uh, but anyway, and our voice even has a similar quality. And I, I, for years, people would would remember that and say, hey, it's Chris Hurstum. <laughs> and uh, Chris Hurstum later, he and I did some political work together. We did some uh, reform work on trying to change our elections in Arizona to do open primaries. And I got I worked with him on that. So anyway, I, I a dear friend of Chris to this day, but that's how it all started when I imitated him on the floor in the mock session in 1988. <laughs> all right. So question nine, what well-known grocer ran for governor back in 94? By the way, I don't know if there's anybody known as Jack Safeway. <laughs> well, I was I was like, I was like, OK, we're making some of these names up. But <laughs> or Sam Sprout. Um, now, Betsy Bayless was not a grocer, but I do believe it was her family that was. The it, it, Bayless it was grocer. it was yeah, her family. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so. uh, I don't think she herself. Maybe maybe she uh, stocked the shelves one time. I don't know. But uh, so but no, Eddie Basha. Now, I this is like back to back questions, Marshall, with with just amazing Arizonans. And uh, so we talked about Polly. Eddie is right up there as well. Um, he just, you know, he passed away nine years ago, way too early. Um, uh, and Eddie, uh, I just had the great privilege to get to know him when he was a member of the Board of Regents and I was running the Students Association. And um, so, uh, you know, I flew on his plane a few times. Uh, I visited his house a lot, got to know his family. Uh, still I'm in touch with Nadine today, his widow. And so anyway, um, but my favorite thing about Eddie, I mean, there are so many. I mean, he was a larger than life character, a huge heart. I mean, what he did for people, I mean, he would do anything for anybody, sh you know, shirt off his back for anybody. Just amazing. But truly what he loved the most, maybe he loved playing practical jokes. He he didn't think anybody should take themselves too seriously. And um, I, in fact, my my only regret in life is I was never actually the victim of his, one of his practical jokes. I thought I would have really <laughs> arrived if I could actually have been, at least that I know of. I don't know. Maybe I maybe there's some silly thing happened to me one day and I had no idea that Eddie was behind it. But um, usually he or it's still home. planted. It hasn't happened yet. Or you're right. That's right. I should be on alert. Um, <laughs> So, uh, but I mean, some of the stories, there are people that know more of these stories than I do, but one of them was uh, Herman Channon was appointed to the Board of Regents. This was before Eddie was actually on, because um, actually I served with Herman Channon. I was the student member of the Board of Regents back when I was in college. And uh, so I served with Herman. He was actually the chairman of the board. Uh, Eddie actually came onto the board later. So anyway, this was before, but he knew Herman. And uh, Herman was known for having kind of a big ego. And so um, and so when he got appointed by uh, the governor, whichever, I guess it was Governor Babbitt, but anyway, got appointed to the Board of Regents, Eddie uh, paid for a billboard in downtown Phoenix that said, it's hard to be humble when you're a regent, Eddie, uh, Herman Channon. <laughs> and he had the billboard up for like a week or something like that. Um, the other, the other thing Eddie would do is he would call people, you know, the classic prankster move, call somebody and imitate them. Right. And, um, actually the people he would get the most is people, he would do a Latino voice and he would, he spoke Spanish I, and, and people would never guess it was him. He disguised his voice so well, his Spanish was perfect. And he, he did all kinds of wild things. He even called like university presidents and got away with that one. But um, he would call, and another thing he would do is he would call the Students Association, not when I was there, but at a different time, and he would he would act like he was a Vietnam veteran, and he got attacked by a dog on campus, and he was going to sue the university, one of the students, to help him sue the university, and literally had the, the folks of the Student Association going. I, I mean, these are just some, I, there are many more of them, but uh, Eddie, Eddie was uh, passionate about education. He decided in 1994 that we weren't doing enough, and that's why he ran. He ran against Fife Symington, um, but it was not. It was a Republican year, so he did not win that year. Okay. 
And then we know what happened then, but... All right. So how can current Governor Doug Ducey make history if he finishes his term of office next January? Yeah, I... Um... I don't know what what people may have selected for the I, I, I would assume most people would be like, OK, it's got to be that really long answer, because who would make that up as a fake answer? Right. Um, but but this is one of my favorite facts that that um, it, 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 but it's soon to not really be a current fact because it could change, assuming he, he finishes out his term of office. Right. So um, so the idea of this and by the way, I'll, I'll be completely transparent. Uh, this is the question where I just show off. So I, I, yeah, I just show off. Okay. Um, because I am able to tell you the progression of governors and what happened to them from 1974 to today. So in 1974, Jack Williams left office and there was an election in Raul Castro. The only Hispanic governor Arizona has ever elected was elected governor. And then in 1977, Jimmy Carter decided to appoint him to be ambassador to Bolivia. And so uh, uh, Ra Raul Castro uh, went off to Washington, and that meant that the uh, Secretary of State succeeded. We learned that earlier, right? That's who becomes governor, right? And so the Secretary of State was Wesley Bolin, and so he succeeded. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, tragically, uh, he didn't live very long, uh, and he died. And uh, that's one reason there's Wesley Bolin Plaza down at the Capitol now. His name's for our governor who died in office, didn't get to serve very long. Now, you say then that means the next Secretary of State becomes governor, right? Nope. Because in order to succeed the office, you must be elected the Secretary of State. And because Wesley Bolin had been elected, he then got to appoint his successor, which was Rose Mufford. She had been the Deputy Secretary of State, and she was named the Secretary of State, but she wasn't elected. So she couldn't become governor when Wesley died. And so then it goes to the next in line of succession, which is the Attorney General, and that was Bruce Babbitt. So Bruce Babbitt in 1978 became governor because a governor died. And then that fall, he ran for election. OK, by the way, Rose Mofford ran for secretary of state. So since she got elected in 19 uh, in 1978. Uh, so then uh, Bruce Babbitt um, ran in 1982 and he won re-election. So he served two full terms and a little bit more. But but he didn't initially come to office under normal circumstances. He was. He was in line of succession. Okay, so we've gone from 1974 to 1982, or 19, actually 1986, I should say. 1986, Bruce Babbitt is not going to run for um, re-election because he's going to run for president. And we just talked about that election. So you know what happened in 1986. And you know that the governor elected 1986 didn't leave under normal circumstances. He was impeached and thrown out of office. And that's when Rose Mofford finally became governor. And then in 1990, she didn't run. And so that's, of course, when we learned that there were two times they had to do the election. Uh, and Five Symington was finally elected. So you're saying, OK, so finally Five Symington did two terms and everything was normal, right? No, he was reelected. He beat Eddie Basha. And then he got convicted in federal court. And if you're convicted of a federal crime, you cannot continue serving as governor. So he was booted out of office. And so that's how Jane D. Hall, who was the secretary of state, uh, became governor. She would then run her herself in 19. Um, I've now I've I've gotten myself lost in my story. I forgot what year it is. But anyway, she would run in her own right and be elected. But remember, she did not initially come to office that way. And then when she was done, there was another election. And that's when Janet Napolitano was elected. So, you know, she gets to start the clock running again on normal circumstances, except what happened to her. We get another appointment by a president. Right. She's appointed Homeland uh, Secretary of Homeland Security by new President Obama. So that's when she goes off to Washington. And Jan Brewer is the Secretary of State and she, she succeeds to the office. And then she runs and she's reelected or, or elected. But uh, again, didn't start office under normal circumstances. Right. And after she left is when Doug Ducey ran for governor. And so literally, I've been sitting here watching the clock since Doug Ducey, who I went to college with at ASU, by the way, I've been watching to see whether Doug Ducey is going to leave before he finishes two terms and we're going to continue this progression that goes always back to 1974 but if he stays all the way to january we're finally breaking the chain <laughs> all right so i showed off my knowledge of arizona governors from the 1970s <laughs> to the 20s. indeed and here you show off again 
<laughs> so I, Wat Tong, Wat longtime legislative leader, was too young to serve when he was elected. Another one of my favorite Arizonans, Art Hamilton. Um, Art Hamilton uh, was the um, uh, leader of the Democratic Caucus when I was an intern, so I got to work for him. Uh, just an amazing person. Um, so when he first ran for office, I meant to check the year on this. I, I forgot to go back and check. But uh, in the early 70s, I want to say it was about 74 or something like that. But Art Hamilton uh, ran when he was 24 years old. And his birthday was actually after the um, legislators are sworn in. You have to be 25 years old in order to serve in the state legislature. So you can run. I mean, a, a five-year-old could run for governor or, or, or run. I mean, anybody can run for office. You just can't serve if you aren't the right age, right? And so uh, literally, uh, uh, he couldn't take office on the first day of the legislative session. And so he had to be appointed to the office uh, like a week later. His birthday was in January. It was like a week or two oh. later. Um, uh, so then, you know, then the next time, of course, and then, and then he was in, he was in for many, many, again, these are the, there were no term limits back then. So he was in for many years. But the reason that I actually want to talk about art is because art is uh, connected to my life's most embarrassing moment story. Uh, so as I said, I worked for art Hamilton, um, in, in, uh, in 1988 as an intern. So I got to know him pretty well. I was a lobbyist after that. So, you know, I lobbied him and all that. So this is when I was a lobbyist. And I knew him very well. And I was working on a bill. I, I lobbied for education and environmental issues, but this was an education issue. And we were trying to get a financial aid fund created. Ultimately, we did. Um, and by the way, can you put Art's picture back up there again? Is it possible? Of course. Because I think it's important for people to understand um, Art uh, was a uh, very large, imposing figure. He he kind of, you know, I mean, he, he you know, um, uh, wide girth and uh you know he just uh i mean i mean heart of gold but i mean you know he he, he knew how to um make an impression on people with his size right so he always served on the education committee he was passing about education and he'd always sit at the end of the day as nearest to the speaker's podium and i think he did that to kind of you know make an impression on people you know maybe intimidate them a little bit right and so here I am. I think this may be the first time as a lobbyist I'm testifying at the at the uh, before a committee and I'm before the education committee. And I have come up with this tear jerking story to make our case for financial aid. Uh, I'm talking about students having hope uh, about how when they're in high school, so many of them believe they can't ever afford to go to college. But if we create this financial aid fund, uh, they will realize that that there is aid for them and it will give them hope and they're going to stay in school and go to college. And so I, I'm going to give an example uh, from my wife, who was a high school teacher. OK, so I, I've got the story all. I mean, I've probably rehearsed this story for that matter. Uh, and and so I, you know, I get to the swell where I'm like, so, for example, uh, I want to give you one example from my wife, who is a high school student. I said, my wife, who is a high school student, okay? And I mean, I pause because I realize I have just said student, not teacher. And Art Hamilton, who has been kind of looking down because it's like, you know, McWhorter kid, you know, and former intern, you know, I'm not going to pay that much attention to him. He does this take and he looks up and he's like, he's like, I always knew there was something about you, McWhorter. <laughs> <laughs> And then laughed. I mean, he just because he had a great laugh and uh, he still does, by the way, he's still alive. He's around us. Uh, and so anyway, uh, I had to recover. And, you know, it, my story lost all of its impact. It's OK. I still got to vote out of committee. So it all worked out. But it was it was truly an embarrassing moment. <laughs> all right. So here we are in our last question. And I'm wondering if you may have had any influence in this. <laughs> well, so uh, what's fun about this last question is it brings together, you know, I, I said I, I work in the arts now uh, with all this political stuff. So back in the, um, you know, 1990-ish, uh, after the impeachment, uh, you know, I mean, not just the impeachment, everything happened before that, you know, the boycotts because of the Martin Luther King holiday. You know, we actually ended up passing the Martin Luther uh, King holiday with a vote of the, uh, 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 the voters passed it. 
we are the only state that did that, by the way. And a lot of people want to say that we are really bad about Martin Luther King Day, but we actually are the only state that didn't do it with executive order. We have, Now, we had to because Evan Meekham got rid of the executive order, but with the voters actually passed it. Anyway, but, uh, and, and that, you know, hopefully the boycotts got lifted and all that. And then we go through the impeachment. And then we had a big scandal in 1990 uh, where they got legislators taking bribes. I mean, uh, just, I mean, our politics for several years there were, we were nationally renowned. It was like literally part of our brand as a state, which was, was not good. But it, so much of it was so comical that these two great uh, gifted um, uh, actors in, in Tempe wrote a musical. It's called Gov the Musical. Uh, and it, it it was so popular, it kept getting extended over and over. I mean, they kept selling <laughs> out. Um, they ended up then, I actually, the first one was mainly just about Mecham and all the impeachment stuff and all that. Then the scandal happened and they had to write Gov 2. So there was even a second version. And that one kept getting extended over and over and over again. But anyway, uh, but when Gov, uh, the musical first, uh, you know, it, it just started and a friend of mine who was also, I was in college at the time and he and I were both into political stuff and he and I both went and I mean, because we were so into this stuff. I mean, I was in the front row at the impeachment. I know all this stuff. I mean, we laughed at jokes that even other people weren't getting. I mean, these guys were good. They did, they did their, you know, homework and they had, you know, like good details and oh my gosh, we just, I, I mean, I remember literally being exhausted. I laughed so hard, you know, like it just, it was laugh after laugh after laugh. But the, uh, the, the, the playwrights came up to us afterwards and they said, can you guys come to every show? <laughs> I mean, we, I mean, we, we're having good audiences. It's all good, but you guys get every single joke. <laughs> and so anyway, I think we did go two or three more times, but, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, it does strike me um, that there's a little theme in a couple of these things. There was the mock session after the impeachment. There was Gov, the musical. And it strikes me that we, uh, we are ripe for another one of these. You know, we've had some pretty crazy political years again in Arizona. And I think somebody needs to write another musical or another something that that just let's laugh at ourselves. Let's be like Eddie Bash has said, don't take yourself too seriously. Let's have some fun with this. If if it's got to be the way things are, we might as well, you know, some of it's serious stuff and we should take it seriously. But we also got to learn to laugh at ourselves. So and um, and I also want to finish with that because, you know, it talks about the arts and and, um, you know, I just I, I've got to say that uh, in, in our work at Arizona Citizens for the Arts, Marshall, we're about arts, culture and heritage uh, and the humanities. And what you're doing here is such a rich part of that. I'm just so excited that you're doing this. And so if you want to learn more about how you can get involved in supporting the arts, um, that's where you can find me. Indeed. And we always like always like to end with kind of just find how did people do i mean like sarah already posted her score so just wondering how other people did on the trivia but i always like to point out that it's not just about did you get the answer right but look at the great stories <laughs> oh and anita got nine oh actually wow those are really high scores <laughs> usually cool. it's like we're in like the threes and fours so all right so we have a great crowd out there Good so, you. so well, Patrick, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your history and Arizona history. Well, thank you. You know, it's funny, Marshall, when you first reached out to me, I said, um, history, you know, I mean, I've only been in Arizona for 40 years and you stop to think, you know, we're 110 years old. I guess I, that's darn near close to half of it, I guess. Right. Uh, and, and it's hard to think of some of these stories from the eighties being history, but I guess they are now. Uh, and as you point out to me, if it happened yesterday, it's history. But, uh, uh, you know, it, I think the great thing about Arizona is we all get to be a part of history in this place all the time. I think this is a place that's always reinventing itself all the time and fun stuff happens. So it was fun to relive it all with you. It's been great. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And have a great rest of your night. And now you can find out what happened yeah. in those last two minutes. Yeah. Nobody tell me. Nobody tell me. I got to go watch. See what exactly. Happens. No spoilers. <laughs> so that way Patrick can get off here, go watch the recorded game and see what actually happened and see who won <laughs> and who goes on to a next playoff. All right. Well, it's going to be right. the same. I just know it. All right. <laughs> All right, Patrick. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye.
Oh my gosh. You know, that was so much fun. You know, it's like, especially hearing all those personal stories and, you know, and some of those folks, I mean, like Eddie Bash, I mean, I've only heard stories about, but I've never, sadly, never got a chance to meet him. But I do know he has a really great art collection. So, which is now kind of open to the public, which is really cool. So now we come up to From the Vault. And so, you know, kind of as we talk about art and things, I want to talk about a little town called Yucca, Arizona, which was part of a land scam since we're kind of doing kind of Arizona kind of, oh no, not you. Um, so this little town was involved in a land scam, but one of the crown jewels was going to be this restaurant that is shaped like a golf ball. Now, it didn't actually get a chance to open up as a restaurant, but it is now the Area 66 Museum, which is talking about when a UFO supposedly crashed near Kingman. So I keep hearing that this is actually a really good museum. They keep kind of upping their exhibits a little bit. So I really want to get up there and see it. Now, it's about a four hour drive. So I figure if I time it right, I can get there. And it's also on the international i-11 that basically mexico to canada highway and because of that recently opened up an indian restaurant and from what i hear it's really good so i'm hoping to the, get up there go to the museum and then go have a meal right next door at the indian restaurant so hopefully i can make it up there fairly soon but you know also, just to see kind of that Area 66, kind of our own version of Area 51. So looking forward to that. So now you'll see why I always suggest that if you're on Facebook, you should share it because, you know, look at all the fun we're having with Arizona history. So next week, our guest is Carmela Ramirez, who is a local musician and has a ton of amazing stories. Um, it also is the kickoff of preservation month so there'll be some other events going on that we'll talk about as well so it's going to be a great kickoff next week for that so stick around i will see you same bat time same bat channel next week and remember if you get a chance you know please throw me a note especially if there are things that you're like hey you know i wish i had seen that or i have somebody who would be great for you to talk to we can happily do that. So as we get ready to close the evening, I always want to give out a shout out to PJ, my cocktail advisor, Chris and Cole for that amazing video they do. And we are going to leave with, I'm going to, one of the things we talked about when I was chatting with the folks from Teach for America was we were talking about the murals all around town and kind of how you'll see so many of them. And I go back to 1986, since we're kind of on an 80s kick, and talked about Keith Haring and his mural. So we're going to see a little bit of the video of him painting in downtown Phoenix with about 60 students from South Mountain High. Thank you all so much, and have a great rest of your night. <laughs>